Welcome, everyone. Good boy, Tucker. This is learning at its most fun. All right, welcome everybody to Takeover Tuesday. We are here with Sharice Spiller. You can see her beautiful PowerPoint here. Sharice is with Level Best. So if you haven't heard of Level Best, they are a one-on-one -on -one consulting firm. Uh, she has been doing this for quite a while now and she's really sought after. So she definitely, you know, has, I know when I work with offices one-on-one -on -one and they're looking for more one on you know more of a practice management solution Sharice is who I send them to uh, she and level best her they all work with financial planners and proactively engage with them on their current process their systems and implementing new things to scale your business so I'm really happy she's here again to join us uh, she's gonna be able to share with us uh, a new presentation here and she's had many speaking events anywhere from you know lpl to td ameritrade so we're very honored to have her here as well so sharice i'll go ahead and hand it over to you and then like i said as questions come up definitely let us know and we're happy to help <laughs> Thank you, Nora, and thank you all for attending today. It's such a great opportunity uh, to be here with you over your lunch hour. I'm in Houston, Texas, so it's noon, definitely my, my lunch hour. So I don't know where you're at, but in the chat, if you want to drop it in. Um, so like Nora said, I am the founder and lead consultant of Level Best. I founded Level Best in 2016. The goal of Level Best is to help business owners and team members have the peace of mind with knowing that they have a streamlined operation. So we work with firms across the country, 100% virtual, and I truly love what I do. As Nora mentioned, this is a new presentation uh, for this year. So I hope you guys really enjoy it. Just to let you know at the end of this presentation, I have a QR code for you with a free guide and the slides that I'm going over today. So this is gonna be very uh, tactical um, session. If you want to get your notepads out, take some notes, I'm gonna walk you step-by-step step how to build a scalable service model. So to get started, today's agenda, what we're gonna go over is how to organize your service offerings. My goal here is to turn reactive services into a tried and true process. I'm sure a lot of you have had your practice for decades or many years. So let's eliminate the reactive and shine. Show your clients what you do best. In addition to that, I want to go over understanding the benefits of each service that you offer. So you are an expert. You are good at what you do. And it's second nature. So sometimes I find that business owners and advisors struggle with truly seeing the benefits that your clients see when working with you. After that, we're gonna go over identifying your ideal client attributes. We are in a unique position right now where firms are serving multiple generations. I just got off the phone with an advisor and he said, you know, he's not only working with his clients, but their kids and their grandchildren and your team is also multi-generational. So how can we make sure the client avatars align as your business evolves? And I want you to think beyond the financial planning process. You are a financial planner, but you are a service provider in addition to that. So we wanna make sure that we're having a, a comprehensive experience for your clients. And then finally, my favorite, setting up a delegation plan for your service model. I don't want you to think you have to do this alone. Giving advice is one part of delivering a service. So we're going to talk about other people, service providers that you can incorporate into your process. So let's dive in. The first thing I want to talk about is selecting your firm's core service offerings. Before you dive in and think through this, I want you to identify 
identify your firm's goals. Before you think about auditing your core service offerings, you really want to be intentional. So some of the goals that some firms may have, it may be succession planning. You may be bringing on uh, younger advisors to your firm, bringing on another partner. Another popular reason would be that your clientele is changing. So you may want to add uh, subscription planning, planning only. You may want to phase out and investment management only. As you go through your career, you're going to find opportunities to deliver services better. So you just really want to be intentional. Another big thing is evaluate the current way you do business. What's working and what's not. I personally really enjoy doing SWOT analysis. It's an old school way of doing things, but it gets the job done and it really highlights you know, what you should focus on and what's working already. So to start, this outline is the core services that I see firms using. So we have planning, investment management, and then the full suite of services. When I initially prepared this presentation, I didn't have the specialty services, but I really wanted that to add that here because I think it's also important. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you guys are obviously offering a luxury service. And when life events happen, I'm sure you guys are the first people that get called, whether it's something happening in their own life, whether it's a death or a divorce, you might be the first person people call. Or if it's a life event in the world, I'm sure you guys are getting bombarded as well. So it is kind of important to just realize your own worth, like Sharice is saying, but then also just kind of stick to what you're doing really well and then throw in other things as you see fit. You know, mm -hmm. throw in the subscription service as you see the industry changing, or if you, you know, pick up someone that you think would be really a good successor, then start throwing in that succession planning. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's, you want to work off what's already working and then just refine as you go. And so like with these services, these are all offerings that I'm sure most of you are already utilizing, but I just want to cover them high level. So with financial planning, when I talk to advisors, they'll say, we offer estate planning or investment planning. Financial planning is really all of those topics. Now, the differentiator with financial planning is, are you doing a one-time plan or is it an ongoing service? So when you, if you're selecting financial planning for a core offering, you really want to differentiate the two. And then with investment management, it is okay for investment management to still be standalone. A lot of people want to move away from it, but there still is a value add for investment management services. And after that, I have specialty services. So this is more like if you have a niche, like I think about the advisors who may work with dentists or medical professionals or advisors that work with uh, business owners or executives. So the specialty service are those planning topics that are in addition to the general planning process. So I see like tax preparation, business planning services. If you only work with business owners, you may want to offer bookkeeping. I just saw someone talk about that in a forum. And then finally, I have uh, the full suite of services. So taking everything you do and bundling it into one package. So this should include everything. It should be ongoing and it's a top ticket item. And like the big thing here is it should be ongoing. So I have that ongoing monitoring and implementation support. That's that accountability piece that you want to provide to your clients. So are you seeing people more outsourcing the investment? side? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I think, you know, a TAMP is a really popular item, uh, which I have later in the presentation that people are using to help with running their investment management. Hmm. 
So if we take this into practice, like just here's a few examples. So I talked about the one time financial plan. I see this fading away. A lot of advisors are having awareness, it's like a one time plan. It works for some. But most of the time, you're going to find that your clients come back to you six months later and say, hey, I have a quick question, and you are planning to only work with them for three months. So I think it's important to be very clear. We are going to offer you this analysis of your financial situation, but then it's up to you to implement it on your own. If you want us to help you implement and be that accountability partner, then they need to go to the subscription-based planning, which is the direction that most advisors are going. Because we know as soon as you present a plan, your client can walk out of the office and it changes instantly. So I think that's why people are leaning towards a subscription planning. And then, like I mentioned, uh, investment management. So this is a legacy service offering and it's typically bundled with the subscription planning as well but there still are firms that come to me and say you know our legacy way of doing business has been investment management so you may always have people on that model so after you go over and select your service offerings you want to then go into benefits. But before I move on, I see most firms having about two to three core service offerings and then nothing more. So I don't know if anyone in the chat wants to comment on that. If you and your business has about two to three service offerings or more, that would be helpful for us to know as I go through the next slide. So after you select your service offerings, you want to capture your benefits. So when you're capturing your benefits, you want to think about your unique value proposition. So there's a lot of financial advisors, but there's only one of you. So think about all those unique benefits that you add. And this is what I was saying earlier. You can do most of this second nature. So you really have to find time to be intentional, listen to your clients when you get a compliment during a meeting, make sure you write it down so it can be added to your benefits list. So I split it up in three areas. The first one I love is key expertise. So I'm not an advisor, but I am a coach. I am a consultant. And it is so important to know the value that you're bringing to your clients. I read a book recently that totally changed my perspective. It was called The Business of Expertise. I forget the author's name. Phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. It had a blue cover on it. And it's a very quick, short read. It really changed the way I, I look at it. So when you're thinking about your key expertise, think about the, your designations. Like if you're a registered life planner, a CFP, a CPA, CFA, whatever it may be, that's knowledge that the average person doesn't have. So it's good to keep that in mind. Um, and then I also think about the personalized recommendations. We are in a Google social media era where people can find information there, but it's not tailored to them specifically. So if someone wants help with how to manage and grow their investments and better their financial life, I think that's when expertise comes in and giving people the clarity that they need. In addition to that, you want to think about how your clients feel. So do you want uh, your clients to feel empowered and you're really guiding them through a great process, you're very collaborative, or do you want your clients to feel free of the financial, the financial juggle that they're having? So I think about business owners, executives, they're really busy and they just want someone to come in, help them feel calm, and they feel confident in your abilities to take over the management of their financial plan and just keep them in the loop as big decisions are made. So do you want a delegator or a collaborator? That's really interesting. You know, maybe at the end of meetings with clients, you do kind of note down a sentiment that you feel like you do interact with them with. You know, do you have to go in calm? Do you have to go in really confident? I'm sure people 
are really different. But really what you're mentioning reminds me of when the DOL was trying to really enact the fiduciary standard where everyone was overnight almost required to reach out to their clients and let them know that in fact I am your fiduciary and your friend, you know. And I think a lot of people are really scared. They're like, oh my mm. God, I have to reach out to everyone and they're all gonna like turn on me. But from my experience, I feel like people really welcomed it well. They were like, you're my friend, you know, you do everything for me. Of course, it's fine if you raise your prices or of course it's fine if you have to have me sign this contract of fiduciary, you know? So I, I think that is reminding me a lot of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's just really having that partnership with your clients. And then when those items arise, they trust you and they know that you're, you're in their corner. I think that's, that's such a good example. And that like talks, takes me to like the return on investment. So peace of mind is like, I, like I said, that's what I tell my clients, but I think it is really important to show someone like you have one person that's aware of your all planning aspects. And like myself, I have a financial planner and my husband and I, we can sit down with someone and they can be almost the tiebreaker most of the time when we're trying to make decisions and I have on here coordination. So another big piece with ROI is coordination with other professionals. So most of the time, a lot of people are dealing with realtors, mortgage lenders, accountants, financial planners, but it's nice to have that one person in the center of all of it with you as you're making decisions as well. So yeah, I hate to say it, but I feel like in life events, people can't think you know, you almost go paralyzed. So you are the person that's going to tell them, you know, this is who you call, or this is what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I just um, see a comment, uh, someone commented about financial planning first and pursuing the flat fee model. I really think like when I get to, I think two more slides and talking about how we can really differentiate the tiers of service and feel confident with building a experience out. So then you don't fall into uh, the old way of doing business while you're trying to make a change. It definitely takes time to get in the habit of making these changes. And there's a lot of things you can do up front. So when it's time to flip that light switch, you can confidently do it. So after you select your service offerings and your benefits, then we want to go over client attributes. I love going over this because usually advisors can tell me instantly what type of client they look for. So if you think about the qualitative, it's very subjective. Like honestly, in your firm, if you're a multi-advisor firm, every advisor is probably going to have a different avatar. So the one thing I do want to mention here, if you are a new business owner, you may fall into the habit to sign. There's no better way to say it, but just sign anyone with a pulse. And while that's nice early on, it is such an emotional, mental drain as you start getting clients. So I think if you run into a situation where you have that client that is just keeping you up at night or is just driving you crazy, go back to this list so you can justify your reasoning on the type of clients that you're taking on. You may find that you're taking less clients that, you know, from the prospects that are coming in, you're only signing a few, but you want them to be quality. So what is quality for you? So if you think about uh, the qualitative piece, a lot of advisors tell me they want someone that's a nice person and that is bought into the process. You want to work with someone that's not going to give you pushback every single time you're recommending something. Um, and then you have the other side of things where it's quantitative, very cut and dry. You know, do you work with young professionals, pre-retirees? If you are a niche business, you may only work with Google employees or you may only want to work with business owners. So like some of the examples I think about, 
Um, do you want someone that's financially savvy? So there's some advisors that want to work with people that already have a strong foundation, but they need help more on a high level um, area of their financial plan. Whereas there's other advisors that do not mind being that first financial plan in that client's life. And they're leaning more into educating their clients. So it it really all depends. Another big one that I think about is, are your clients already contributing to their investments, uh, but looking for guidance? Like some people want people that are already contributing uh, to accounts. So that is the start of building service models. So As a recap, you should have selected your service models, identified your benefits, and then clarified your client attributes. Now, would you make that client facing? Because you think, you know, as clients, they're investigating you, they're going to your website, your social media, trying to find out about you. Is, do you suggest for them to, you know, find ways to see if they are this fit through like their website or social media Mm -hmm. somehow? I think that's an amazing question. So I think you should make it clear what type of people you want to work with. I'm not a marketing person, but I have a marketing person and you want it to be really clear. Like, Hey, we work with young professionals. We work with retirees. You want it to shine and stand out. And I think that takes me back to the unique value proposition and the benefits why should an individual work with you? Well, if you're very clear with your marketing, I think that's, that's going to help. Another point to add is like kind of, this goes into prospecting. A lot of firms are putting forms on their inquiry forms or their website. I have one myself. So basically it's like, if you're interested in working with us, here's five questions or three questions, whatever it may be. And then you can have a vetting process for the clients that are coming into the firm. I like that. Cause I feel like everyone wants to find their tribe, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just having people giving, giving people a way to find you and letting them know, like you found the right place, you know? I deal yeah. with every, every situation you might be in. Mm-hmm. Totally. So I want to dig into the details of service models. I, this is kind of my favorite part now that I'm about to go over it. <laughs> so I call this like the components of each level of service. So like I said, if you have two to three services, you want to go through this process each time. So the components of the level of service, you want to think about all your tiers and basically start with your top package. So you want to brain dump, okay, what's everything we do? So with financial planning topics, you just want to list them out line by line. Don't forget those specialty items that I talked about where, you know, like it's a planning topic, but you're not offering it to everyone. Like someone mentioned in the comments that they do one-time plans and they offer subscription planning. I find that a lot of firms aren't offering a full-blown intense comprehensive plan. They may do like a financial plan light for one-time plan people. So really differentiate the two. Another thing you could do is break out investment topics from financial planning topics which takes me to account servicing. So I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but please do not um, undervalue account servicing. A lot of advisors do. And I think it may be because there's probably someone else in your firm that's servicing the accounts. So you may forget that that value is still there, but it's just so important, like having a point of contact for all your account needs I see advisors when move money requests need to come in, they're coming to you. You're reaching out to your clients to make sure they take care of their R&D. I think that it's really important, which takes me to technology as well. So with technology, we have the financial portal, which like it's pretty common. I think everyone here should have one. I love talking about technology because it's, a portal and a hub for their 
for your clients to keep track of their accounts, access statements, a hub for follow-up items. And this reminds me of a, a client, several clients over the years that said, oh, we use e-money or right capital and we don't like the task feature. And I told them, you know, it's not about you, it's about the client. So sometimes keep in mind, you are not gonna be the end user of that experience. So the few advisors I'm thinking about right now, as soon as they implemented like the task feature in the client portal, their clients came back and was like, oh my God, that's such an amazing feature. Because to your client, they're just logging into one system. They can see their statements. They can upload to their vault. They can review their transactions and all of their action items for meeting with you. Peace of mind, again, like that standard level of care is what you're providing to them. And another thing on technology, don't forget about internal tools. So if you have different tiers of service, like I think about tax projection software, that may be for your planning clients, but not your investment clients. While they're not logging into it, you're still using it on the back end. Um, and then I have outsource solutions, very popular now. So a lot of people want that comprehensive, uh, holistic approach with servicing their clients. So they're adding tools like um, tax preparation, advisor facing tax is one that I can think of. XY Planning Network is offering tax uh, preparer services to the members on their platform. And so basically the advisor is covering that cost for their clients and then delivering it as part of their service. Um, insurance, so LLIS is another one. There's a tool for wills and trust prep, and then of course a TAMP. So these are all platforms that were built for advisors to plug into their services. The other side of that though, I work with advisors that say, I don't wanna do that Sharice, I don't want to bundle. Then I think you need to really lean in to coordinating with other professionals. So basically this reminds me of myself. I bought a house a few years ago. I'm new to Houston, originally from Pittsburgh, didn't know anyone. We had a mortgage lender and he was able to give me a list of five realtors. And we interviewed all five of them and we picked the one that worked well with us. Anytime something needed to be communicated to the mortgage lender, the realtor did it. It gave me such peace of mind. There was no conflict. Whereas I had a relative of mine who piecemealed their team together to buy the house. And it took so much longer because the professionals weren't on the same page. So I think advisors now have an awareness of what good referral partners and trustworthy people can do for your clients and for, your, for you as well. It's nice to work with the same people because you get into a rhythm like of how to hand clients off, how involved are you in the process. So I think this is a line item that I used to tell people you should do, but now I do spend a little bit more time when I'm working with advisors on identifying, okay, what relationships do you need to get in place for future clients? Yeah, I think all of those take so much extra time, right? It takes so much mm -hmm. extra time to coordinate them with another professional, or it takes extra time to offer that extra tax piece or that estate piece. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if you think of it as almost word of mouth marketing, where, you know, someone's going to get their estate taken care of and then go call someone about it or tell their neighbor about it. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to refer you, you know, so yeah. these, these might be little, you know, opportunities for your clients to then talk to their people to bring people in. Mm hmm. I totally agree with you. And I, I've heard this saying before, like the financial planner is the quarterback of the financial plan, but there needs to be a full team. And everyone knows that your services are not going to be undervalued by you bringing in other professionals. So just think about ways to make it easy on your firm with bringing uh, other people in. I come from a wealth management background. We worked with a lot of high net worth individuals before I started uh, practicing as a consultant and they just had, you know, 
um, an insurance broker come in like twice a month to meet with clients jointly with advisors. So whatever way works for you. But I think for small businesses, the outsource solutions and finding local people in your network, grab coffee with them quarterly. I do it myself. Something like that will be very impactful uh, for, for you, your team, and your clients. My final point on this slide is implementation and monitoring. So I think this is huge. I love accountability for my business um, and for my financial plan that I have with my financial planner. Some of the things that I see stand out to me for implementation monitoring is of, of course accounts, but also goals. So you're going over goal setting and goal planning with your clients, but how are they progressing through those goals? And as they're progressing through those goals, what if you need to remove obstacles? Those are some of the things that you may not get if someone's on a one-time plan. If a client is investment management only, you, you're not going to do as much accountability work. But if you have that comprehensive planning client, you're going to help them with their goals, accounts, making sure they're staying on track of progress and be an accountability partner for them. So that's everything for the components of each service. And my next slide that I want to go over is uh, building, building in wow factors. Very, this is such a controversial topic. And I want to keep it high level because really wow factors is dependent on the firm and the advisor. I look at a wow factor as like what a company does to go above and beyond client expectations in delivering a great service experience. So basically you want to be unique and you want to have your own style. If you are in a place in your business where you are just trying to have a consistent service offering, do that first. Get your planning process down, streamlined, and then focus on ways to level up. I know a lot of firms have trouble thinking through wow factors, so I would really like if people in the chat can just share what are some wow factors that your firm's providing to clients or something that you're planning to implement in 2022? And at the end of the slide, I would love to take a look at it. The first thing I have on my list is presentation. So presentation to me, to me means everything you're putting in front of the client is clean, clear, and concise. Branding is important, making sure things are organized. This may be your financial plans. When's the last time you updated your financial, your financial plan? Technology is changing. A lot of you guys plug in different tools to create your financial plan. Email templates, um, branded deliverables. A lot of people stop marketing as soon as the client comes in. So they see all these beautiful graphics and deliverables. And then when they become a client, you're not providing like how-to resources, um, a client welcome packet. Like those are some of the things that you can add for a presentation. I like to say like for my business, we do things the level best way. Like this is how we like to present ourselves. I like that. And I remember when CRM, when people were first starting with CRM, a lot of times we would say, you know, clients come in, they see your office a mess, papers everywhere. You know, they're going to assess whether or not, you know, are you technolog technologically savvy? Are you able to take on their services onto your plate? And I think mm -hmm. that's transition to even like we were, me and Sharice were talking pre-conversation about canva for example where it brands all of your social media and your presentations together and mm -hmm. i think that is the next step where it's like okay we kind of did the thing of getting them in the door and making <laughs> sure they know who we are but we need to continue that you know yeah. whenever they get a paper from us it looks like this or they always have it nicely put in this file I've even seen an office have it built into their process to put their client's name on a marquee. 
as wow. they arrive. So they walk <laughs> into their door and their name's like on a marquee. Awesome. You know, fabulous. Mm -hmm. I think that probably gives that client some warm and fuzzies inside when they walk in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Elizabeth's saying she does the marquee. That's awesome. <laughs> that Elizabeth is. probably knows that that makes yes. a difference with the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please add um, more wow factors. I, I love it. I, I'd say I, I want my, my presentations and everything I put in front of a client, I just say to look pretty. <laughs> but to the marquee point, I think that takes me into the personalized experience. Again, it depends on what your style is. I like uh, one firm, they told me this years ago, but they did a pie pickup. So if they were very local. So they around Thanksgiving, they would just email everyone and say, hey, we have some pies in the office while you're out, you know, doing the holiday shopping, whatever it may be, stop by and pick up a pie. Another one that I see a lot of advisors doing are uh, a book gift. So some of my clients have written books, whereas others may have an approach like the psychology of money is on my list. I have one here that was gifted to me, value-based financial planning. What personalized touch can you add to your client experience? So traditional ones are like birthday cards, holiday gifts, but, you know, start to think of some other unique ways for, for that. Consistency. <laughs> A lot of small businesses struggle with this. I am guilty of it myself. But basically, remember, you are a practitioner, you're delivering financial planning, but you are also a business. So whatever you promise you need to do, a lot of advisors tell me they're good at selling, but when they get the client, they get concerned about the level of service and keeping that consistency, which takes me to follow through, delivering on what you promise. It's that accountability. Your clients will clients hold you accountable. When you're promising someone something, you're going to make sure you have that standard of care and quality throughout your client journey. And then finally, I just want to touch on technology. So high level, we all know what it's like when technology does not work. So that's going to happen, but you want to have someone on your team that can help troubleshoot technology problems. You want to make technology a complement of your service and not a burden. And like I said earlier, just make sure you separate what you want from what your client wants. One thing I just want to add here is like LastPass. So advisors are always like, why are you telling me to use LastPass? I'm not telling you to use it, but a lot of new clients may get overwhelmed with the different logins that they have. So why not recommend LastPass to them or another password manager? Because you're not the only firm they work with. So it would be nice if they're like, oh, I can put all of my bank accounts and other providers into LastPass. So then if you have all of your client access tools on your website, they can just go to your website and see, okay, this is the system that I need to get into. And then LastPass will populate the password. So if you're not familiar with LastPass, definitely check it out. I think it's a, a great tool. Do you see kind of one day as, you know, clients get more technology efficient, do you think that they'll actually have preferences soon? One day, you know, you'll have to show your technology suite and your clients would be able to choose what they prefer to use? Mm, I kind of see a little bit of that. So uh, there's some advisors I work with that use Precise FP. So I don't know if there's any Precise FP users in the audience, but basically- mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I love Precise FP. I'm a fan of it too. And so now they have an option. So for to authenticate the user you're sending the form to, you can have them authenticate through email, uh, text message, or username and password. So we're kind of already getting there. And I think about like Right Capital has an app or you could log on to your computer. So there's a, a lot of ways that it's being a little bit more customized. It reminds me of like, you know, the preferred method of contact. Do you want a phone call? Do you want a letter in the mail? Like, you know, the paper or electronic? Like, I think it's, 
it's already going that way. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, mounds of research. I know even when I was getting my master's, it was always kind of a, you know, as you offer these luxury services, how do you reward clients for these this loyalty? Mm. And really, I think a lot of it comes down to at least what we found is just spontaneous stuff. Because yeah. like you said, you're going to get the birthdays. You're going to get the anniversary cards. You might get flowers when somebody, you know, has passed away at their anniversary. But yeah. what about like the spontaneous stuff that could be more meaningful as mm -hmm. you are offering these luxury services? Yeah, I, I, I like that. I think about like milestones, like for me personally, one of my clients posted on social media that he had his 10 year anniversary for his, owning his business. So I think that's awesome. And I know he loves to travel. So I just sent him an airline gift card, but having, keeping track of that may be difficult for some, but I think it's really good. So someone, David mentioned, he plants a tree for every new client. I think that's really awesome. awesome. There's, yeah, there's a site called Tis Best. I believe it was built by advisors. And basically if you're really charitable, you can send a charitable gift card to your clients and then they can pick a charity of their choice. I've seen that too. Um, but I think that's all we have in the chat for wow factors. So I'm going to move on to my last point, which is incorporating team members and solutions into your service offering. So every business owner and advisor needs support. If you really want to focus in, your, in on your craft, you're going to need other people to help support the client and the client experience. So this slide is meant for you to really realize like you need to allow your team to come in and help. So if we start with advice and expertise, as we were mentioning earlier, and reminder, this is internal team members and external you want to think about those other professionals that can help you and your clients. What outsource solutions do you want to plug in? Like I mentioned, advisor facing tax, um, LLIS, things like that. And then, you know, advisors are splitting up. There's financial advisors, then there's portfolio managers, servicing advisors, thinking about what people on your team can specialize in a certain area of advice. And then you have operations. So I don't know if you guys know this, but your operations people can be client facing. Everything the client needs is not only going to involve uh, financial planning advice. I think you're gonna have people with tech questions or they're having trouble making a contribution to their account. They need to reschedule a meeting. This is when you want to tap into the operations professionals to really help support you in the client journey. Another one that comes to mind is just like the TAMP. Um, account servicing is the biggest area where advisors need help. This is where an operations professional can help. Their focus is to really create that consistent client experience for the firm, make sure the technology is up and running. And if there's a problem, they can be there for you and the client. Whereas your job really is to be the, the main expert of the client journey. And then for the administrative piece, this area of the business is internal. They're really making sure you know, the business keeps going. Everyone in the internal office is thriving. So like my just main advice here, and I tell everyone I talk to, until you are 100% client facing as an advisor, which means you're just in meetings, doing notes, you can delegate more if that's what you want to do. Um, so empower your team to support you and your clients. And then I think you'll be well on your way. And so I just have one more slide and then I can open it up for Q&A. But when you're implementing your new service offerings, what you want to do is pair each service offering with a service calendar. So we talked about what's included. The service calendar talks about how are you going to deliver it? 
And then you want to decide, do you need any new people on your team? Do new services need to be added? And then you need to brief your team on the direction that you want to go with your business and help them and have them help you implement this into your practice. But that's everything I have. And it looks like we have some time to open it up for Q&A. But as I mentioned, this QR code will give you these slides and a guide on how to build your service models into your practice. Yes, so everyone, if you have your phone, just grab that really quickly. You could turn on your camera and just start to take a picture of the QR, QR code. It'll pop up with a link uh, for you to go ahead and access that slide and that PDF directly. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a few more ideas that were mentioned. Caroline mentioned a lot of her clients love pets, so maybe <laughs> a donation to SPCA. I think that's great. It's weird that's mentioned. I know I went to a wedding the other month, um, and this couple loves to rescue animals. That's what they do. They rescue animals. They have a whole network of people that rescue animals. Where at their wedding, they had an adoption event. Like they literally had dogs at the wedding that you can like cuddle with and adopt there. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, if you do have clients that love pets, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, it, it is. I, I really love that. And even I think about um, for those who are local, like having like a food drive. I, I know a lot of firms are virtual right now. So I think it is good. Like I'm seeing so many people talk about all of the charities that they donate to. I think that's awesome. Yes, I know we do that at Red Tail. We literally tie to one foster animal mm. shelter and we as employees will foster them. And, you know, the company offers leave to be able to foster a new pair a new pet and whatnot so it is it really does create a great community mm -hmm. all right and david's asking if there will be a recorded version yes the session is recorded it will take the rest of the week to hit the shop for editing but it will be on our help desk starting next week uh, George is asking if he can get the slides emailed instead of on his phone. Um, I Do I get an email list I can send it out to everyone? That's true. I can send over an email list. Okay. And then you can distribute it that way as well for anyone missing the direct QR code. And then we do have, ask, uh, we are asked if we can go back to the last slide. So okay. let's look the slide right before this one. Yes. Yeah, but otherwise that's a lot of information. I think everyone really has to do some assessing maybe and mm -hmm. really just, I almost want to say it's like soul searching because <laughs> you really <laughs> just have to find out what it is you do and stick to it, you know, really make it condense down to the version that is going to make your business the most successful, you know, try to make, try to limit the exceptions is what you're saying, you know, don't make exceptions for this or exceptions for that. You offer a great service, your clients see you as an amazing value add. So just know that, you know, what your value is and where your boundaries are almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just keep in mind that, you know, things always evolve and change. So what you're offering in your practice today may change a year, two, three years from now. That's true. But I think that goes back to your SWOT analysis suggestion. Mm -hmm. that, are you suggesting that to be done like annually, quarterly, by annually kind of thing because I with, yeah yeah with the SWOT analysis right the O and the T are the opportunities and the threats of the industry right now so True. strengths and weaknesses are internal opportunities and threats are external so yes mm -hmm. you know I would say a world event happens an industry event happens you might have to do another SWOT and see you know where do we 
fit in strength wise and weakness wise with this new change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I think about, um, like business planning. So I do year end business planning, but I find advisors do it in the summer. So they just, that's when they're working on their business. Cause it's usually slower. I know year end planning for year end planning tax season is usually really busy, but the summer it's a little bit slower where you can do that internal work on your business. So I would say annually, I tell people like, if you're going to do a process audit, it's good to do it annually where you're really doing a deep dive. And then for technology and service models, you can do that as well. That's true. And I think we are running into a tech issue about getting an error message from that QR for entering in an email address. Okay. I'll double yeah. check as well. Yeah, I checked it earlier, but. Oh, okay. Um, and also the book, 12 week year is also being recommended. So a lot of great book recommendations. Mm -hmm. It looks like some people are saying that QR code worked for them. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm sure that was a lot of information and, you know, um, we're more than happy to kind of leave it at that so you can go back and let it simmer and digest. And then as questions come along, you could definitely reach out and let us know how things are going. Uh, but we definitely thank you so much for joining us in today's session. We hope that it added some value for you as well. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thanks so much for joining us today for this particular session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 800-206-5030, option three for support, or just shoot us an email over to support at redtailtechnology.com. Thanks a lot and have a great day.